Okay, today I would like us to address the concept of the concept, which Hegel conceives as a matter of <coughs> laying out universality, particularity, and individuality, which are presented as being the moments, the components of the outcome of the logic of essence. The moments are components of what could be considered self-determination. Now, the way I want to approach this <coughs> is to actually look at the argument presented in this section after first looking at what might be considered examples of the distinctions being drawn. I first want to turn to what could be considered examples from the logic itself, and that is to just indicate how universality, particularity, and individuality go inextricably together in reference to the forms of universality that are often taken to be paradigmatic by much contemporary thought and thought influenced by the empiricist tradition. And I'm referring to the forms of individuality that I identified last time as abstract universality and class in both of these forms of universality, uh, the universal seems in a way not to determine the character of the individuals to which it applies. So in the form of the abstract universal, which is pretty much how empiricism regards thought and universality, and one arrives at the universal by starting from an array of given individuals who each present a manifold of features, and one picks out the marks they share in common and abstracts them, leaving behind everything else in the individuals in question. So as a result, this abstracted universal, this generalization, if you will, does not itself tell you anything more about the individuals from which it has been drawn. Because it just takes out that one feature they have in common and leaves everything else behind. So as a result, if this is what thought occupies itself with, abstractions, which is something Nietzsche seems to suggest, then thought can't tell us anything else about individuals. And if we want to know anything more about the individuals that happen to possess a common feature, we can't rely on reason. We have to depend on something else. What would that other vehicle be? which would be the only, only way of informing us about what holds true of these individuals, even though we have abstracted something they may share in common. We have to depend upon observation. Right? And that, of course, is the empiricist root. The thought derives its abstractions by confronting the individuals given an experience. And having those, in, those abstractions does not tell us anything more about the individuals in question. So there are no a priori judgments to be made about other things. We can inspect the common property and, and see what it contains in itself, but that's all. Class is somewhat similar. Classes include the individuals as members, but in including the members, their membership does not itself determine what distinguishes them from one another. Right? Their membership only, in a sense, pertains to the common factor of belonging to the group. It doesn't itself give us any knowledge about how they are individuated, how they are distinguished from one another. So you might wonder, well, if these are, are forms of universality, does universality really have any intrinsic connection to particularity and individuality? And how, moreover, are we to understand the difference between particularity and individuality? Well, in the case of the formal universal, the abstract universal, which is abstracted. If it's going to be something common, there have to be a plurality of particulars. The particulars are particular insofar <coughs> as they share the universal in common. But 
they share the universal in common in exactly the same way. There's nothing about their sharing the universal that distinguishes them from one another. So their sharing the universal does not in any way provide for their plurality. But to share it, which is something that requires plurality, right? To share it involves that there is more than one. To share it, they have to be distinguished from one another. They have to be not just particular, but differentiated particulars. And you can understand the individual as being distinguished from the particular in this sense here of being a differentiated particular. The same thing is true in, in regard of, of the members of a class. If a class is not to collapse into its member, but it's to, to, to be a group, it has to have a plurality of members. But every member is a member in the same way. They each belong. Their belonging does not distinguish them. Yet, if the class is to have a plurality of members, and thereby be a group, a grouping, the members have to not just be particular in the sense of belonging or being a member, they have to be differentiated members, they have to be individual. So in this respect you can see that, and, and the universal, to be a universal has to have particulars, but in having particulars in a way in which the universal doesn't just collapse with the particular and become identifiable with the particular, it requires a plurality. And you don't have a plurality unless the particulars are also individual, and not just particular. So one kind of preliminary way of thinking about the difference between particular and individual is to think of the individual as the differentiated particular. Now, Hegel will refer to two things as uh, examples of the logic of the concept two things as illustrating it. One is self-consciousness. The other is the will. Self-consciousness can be regarded as involving universality, particularity, and individuality in a manner that perhaps pertains more to the way in which the concept of the concept, which we'll turn to later, speaks of how the universal and the particular and the individual go together. Namely, self-consciousness is something that is at one with itself. But it's at one with itself only in so far as it differentiates itself. Only in so far as it has a content, a particularization of its self, of the I, which, although one might say that that differentiation, namely the contents of, of consciousness, are distinct from the I, which accompanies them all, to quote Kant. Nonetheless, these are the I's own determinations. They belong to it. It is at one with them. It is its own self that is here differentiated. And in that regard, the I as something that is at one with itself by differentiating itself into, into determinations that are its own, is at the same time something individuated or individual in virtue of this differentiation or particularization that is bound up with it. Now Hegel points out that there, there are thinkers such as Kant, and he mentions Fichte, who tend to identify the I only with the element of universality. A universality that involves a kind of indeterminacy, a kind of negative um, lack of being identified with any particular content. After all, self-consciousness can have any particular mental content and be one with itself. And so one could regard the I as simply being that indeterminate unity that could be said to accompany any mental content, in that regard having a kind of formal identity. And then the contents of the I are to be found elsewhere. You somehow can't quite root them in the identity of the I. But Hegel points out that that is really a very one-sided way of thinking about universality. Because universality is in the particulars. They're not alien to it. They are its own determination. 
And it's in that way that the universal is going to exhibit individuality. Or the I will have an individuality, and not just be an abstract I that is devoid of individuation. The way it is a universal is something that will end up individuating it. And this might be a way of thinking about how the universal is to be thought of as involving self-determination. The determinations of the universal, which are its particularization, are its own specification. They're not something other in which it's reflected. They're not something other in which it stands in contrast and has its qualitative character by not being what other things are. It's not something that's of a subsidiary level in which it reflects itself. These are its very own determinations. The universal is in the particulars, in its particularization, and is universal only in and through them. And in this regard, we, we don't confront the problem that haunted Plato, who, as I mentioned, tended to think of the universal in its relation to the particular as if we're dealing with a logic of essence relationship where the universal is thought of as an essence that appears in the sensible individuals, which are deficient replicas of the universal. Well, here, they're external to one another. <laughs> the universal of the ideas of Plato have a being of their own, apart from the being of, call it, the, the, the appearances, the sensible phenomena. And that raises the problem, well, how do we connect them if they each have a separate being of their own? What is going to account for their, their connection, their unity, the participation of the universe in the particular? If we think of it in terms where they're really not intrinsically connected, not at one with one another. Well, Hegel turns to the will in the opening of the introduction of the philosophy of right, and I just wanted to leap ahead in a way and point to the discussion there, which takes place, for those of you who have the book, bring it next time on, on, for Friday, um, in paragraphs five following. Hegel attempts to discuss how the will, in being a will, exhibits universality, particularity, and individuality. Now, the will is, is universal, first of all, in the sense that the will in a way, has this kind of indeterminacy. It's free from being bound to any particular content. And yet, it's something that is going to be determining itself and giving itself some content. The will has no reality unless it does so. And in the will giving itself a content, it could be said to will something. And only in willing something do we have a will. That the will, in willing something, passes from being something universal that could be said to pervade everything that it wills to willing something particular. The Hegel points out that there are thinkers who tend to regard the will and freedom just in terms of this single specification of universality. And this involves conceiving of freedom as being a negative freedom. It consists in not being bound to any end, any goal, any aim. The will has the capacity to opt for anything it may be in a position to choose among. It's not bound up to any particular contents. In this respect, the will has universality in the sense that it can abstract from all of the given drives and needs that the individual may have because it is not, like an animal governed by instinct, bound to act or behave in a way that's determined by these given drives that are to be found in it. No, instead it can withdraw itself from them, stand over them, and choose which it will act in relationship to. It has, in that sense, this negative freedom of not being trapped and determined by any of these given features. But as such, it's a capacity. It's a capacity, in a sense, one could say, to, to choose. It doesn't have any content bound up with it. It's not an actuality. It's a freedom from. 
bondage to, to any particular content. But to be a will, the will has to act. It has to particularize its, its universality. It has to give itself determination. And in that regard, it has particularity. Why does it have particularity? In a sense, the determination is something that gives itself. And we want to think about why particularity is going to be connected to that. Well, it's going to be something that gives itself, and the it that it gives itself is the will is, in a sense, having this universality that pervades any content it gives itself. Admittedly, in giving itself a content, it, it gives itself a determination that's separate from its general unity, which is not simply identifiable with that content. But nonetheless, that is its content. It is how it has determined itself. And because that is how it has determined itself, Pagel tells us, the will exhibits individuality. Now, how do we have individuality here? He, he claims that it has to do with the way in which the particularization the will gives itself by willing something is inherently connected to what the will is, to the identity of the will. The will, in a sense, is what it determines itself to be. It is individuating itself in the determination it gives itself. Even though the determination, in a sense, emerges as something distinct from that indeterminacy it has to begin with, as the will poised to give itself some specification. The specification it gives itself, even though it stands distinguished from that general capacity that it has at first, to the extent that it now actualizes itself, it is determining itself. It is individuating itself. It is combining that universal and particular aspect and taking on the form of individuality. And in this respect, willing is not simply a capacity. Willing is inherently something actual. It is, in a sense, what it determines itself to be. Now note, Hegel here, in speaking about the will, has not invoked anything pertaining to cause and effect. He's not using cause and effect determinations. He's speaking about, in a way, how the will is, shall we say, developing itself. He's not speaking about it as a substance that is an active substance acting upon a passive substance and generating transformations that are accidents, that are, shall we say, contingent. Now here, the will in determining itself, in giving itself a particularity, is in a sense determining its own identity. It's individuating itself. Now Hegel lays this out in this very introductory section. And he's going to go on to distinguish what he calls the natural will from the truly free will. And the natural will will be the will that, in a certain sense, just operates as a capacity. And I just want to lay out this. I think it'll give you some insights in thinking about the concept of the concept of or universality, particularity, and individuality itself. The natural will is natural in the sense that it has a form given prior to and independently of its activity. And Hegel does not want to dispute the fact that in order to be a free will, a will that is what it determines itself to be, the will in question must also be a natural will. It must have a cap the capacity to choose. That capacity is not the outcome of choice. That capacity has to be there, right? You can't make any choices unless you have that capacity. And that capacity is formal. Why is it formal? Because it doesn't really care about the content at that yeah. point? Yeah, because it applies to any content whatsoever that you choose the same capacity as it had. Which is another way of, of seeing that the form of one's willing, or who one is as, as an agent, is not being determined by exercising choice. In exercising choice, you're just choosing among given alternatives. And we're, how are these alternatives given? Well, they're given independently of the capacity that the will consists of, right? That capacity doesn't determine what it has to choose among. What determines what it has to choose among are, for example, 
things we have in ourselves by nature, such as needs, desires, drives, also things that confront us in the world, as specific kinds of options, <coughs> cultural factors of all sorts, whatever. But all of these are given independently of our will. The natural will, in a certain respect, neither determines who the agent is, because the form of agency is something that is already given and has to be at hand before one can engage in making any choices. Secondly, that form of agency and the willing in question does not determine what the content will be. It determines which of the given contents will be chosen, but it does not generate the content in the first place. In that regard, even though it has a kind of negative freedom of not being bound to any particular, free, any particular choice, the will here is, in, in some respect, in bondage to the given alternatives. <laughs> Because since it does not generate a content of its own, it can only choose among alternatives that it finds before it. Now, this is not a will that is genuinely self-determining. It's not going to be determining itself. Now, Hegel will speak about self-determination of the will as involving a willing where the content of what is willed is itself freedom? Is itself, in a way, the will is self-determining. The will is going to be willing itself. And the will is not willing itself in the case of the natural will. Well, you might ask, what does it mean for the will to will itself? Well, if it's willing itself, what might that be regarded as being a kind of recipe for? Self-determination. In what sense? In what sense is that another way of, of speaking about self-determination in the context of the will? Gives itself its own content? Yeah, I mean, it's willing itself, right? It's willing itself. It's not acting upon something other. It's not, in other words, imposing some alteration upon some independently given substance. It's concerned with, in a way, its own development, its own self-determination. Now, what we're going to find in the philosophy of right is that Hegel is going to be arguing, maybe not entirely explicitly, but it becomes <coughs> evident when you look at the material that we, we encounter, that the will cannot engage in self-determination unless it acts in relationship to other individuals who are engaged in the same kind of activity that it is engaged in. Or another way of putting it, self-determination is going to consist of structures or interactions of the exercise of rights. And so the ethics that consists in the reality of freedom is going to be a, a, a philosophy or theory of what is the reality of rights. Rights are not privileges. Rights involve a certain kind of prerogative that is not just my prerogative, it would be just my prerogative if it were privilege. It's a prerogative that applies to all agents. Because rights are universal. And it's something that is bound up with honoring their right to do to exercise the same prerogative that I'm exercising. So it inherently involves a relationship between individuals. It inherently involves a kind of intersubjective relation, yes. So it, the free will involves this relationship, but um, that kind of sounds like it's tied to that relationship almost in the same way that the natural will is tied to given alternatives or given options. Well, there, what it will be tied to are individuals engaging in the same kind of willing it's engaged in. So it's determined in connection to an exercise of willing that is the same sort it is, it is involved in. And, and we'll look at examples of this in a concrete way. Um, Hegel will speak about rights and self-determination as always involving a reciprocity. Rights involve a reciprocity. You could call it an equal opportunity. Right? To, 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 and it involves, in a sense, exercising an agency that is not given apart from the willing in question. So for example, as a free citizen, 
You determine yourself politically only by interacting with others who are equally citizens participating in the structures of self-government. And those structures themselves consist of nothing other than the exercise of political freedom by the citizenry. That's what the institutions of self-government consist of. And they're not, not actions that you can partake in apart from the existence of those institutions and the activities in which they consist. Which is another way of saying you cannot determine yourself as a citizen apart from participating in these forms of association. To be a citizen is not something you can be by nature. It's not something you can be as, an, as a single individual. And that's going to be true of all of the, of the forms of self-determination. What allows us to be thought of as self-determination is that you here have a kind of conventional agency that instead of being given by nature like the natural will, which has the capacity to choose, there's going to be an agency that is generated through the willing that it involves. You're going to be determining yourself as a citizen. You're going to be determining yourself as an owner. You're going to be determining yourself as a member of civil society by engaging in the specific forms of exercises of rights, which are going to require a certain kind of interrelationship among agents. So in a certain sense, this way of accounting for self-determination of the will as involving relationships of a plurality of agents is in some respect going to, uh, to confirm the kind of perplexity Socrates is in the Republic, where Socrates says, look, we can't make sense of self-control. We can't make sense of how a single individual can act in such a way that they are both agent and patient at once. Well, in a sense, a single individual who just acts as a single individual is going to be doing nothing other than exercising their natural will. They're not going to be determining their own agency. They're going to be choosing among alternatives of one sort or another. So that in a way, if you're acting in reference to things, or one might say treating others as things, you can't engage in self-determination. You can only exercise the natural will and the kind of negative freedom that it represents. Now, the way in which freedom, on Hegel's account, is going to take the form of interrelations, right, or, or, or realities of rights, interrelations of, of individuals exercising their rights, um, is to some degree symptomatic of how the logical categories can be thought to be exhibited in non-logical realities. There's going to be something more involved. It's not just going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's going to be further, uh, let's say, specifications involved. Um, and you know, we, we want to think about this and what, what that involves, and think about the relationship of what's going on in the logic with what's going on when we attempt to think about such things as ethics, right? Are there any questions about these examples, in a way? Because what I want to do is to return to the discussion of the concept of the concept, that is, the concept as such. And the concept as such is not a particular type of concept, like the abstract universal, or a class, or genus and species. It is, in a sense, the concept as such, or the universal as such. Now, if you look at the, the way Hegel discusses the development of the universal, he begins with universality. And he speaks of universality right, as being something that and this is on, on page 601, is something that can be considered unconditioned, free, absolutely infinite, it has absolute identity with itself. But it does so only by, as Hegel puts it, being a negation of the negation. The universal is going to only be 
absolutely identical with itself by, well, if you, if you want to make sense of this talk of negation, negation, it has to, in certain respect, make itself other and then overcome that otherness. It has to, in a sense, go beyond its initial character as that which is to be self-determined, that which unites positing with what it is to be in and through itself. It is that to begin with, but in being that, it has to move beyond that initial state. It has to differentiate itself as part of its very own identity. And this is not going to depend upon contrast with anything else in the way in which something and other were the basis for quality or something being qualitative. Uh, here it's going to be in and through itself that it is going to generate determination. A determination that doesn't involve contrast with something other. Now, Hegel speaks of this initial determination of the concept where it is simply universal, poised to particularize itself as being what he calls the universal concept. And this is going to be followed by what he calls the particular concept, and then individuality. Now, you may remember that Hegel, in the preceding discussions about the concept, had pointed out that the specifications of the concept, or the specifications of self-determination, are each, in some respect, the whole. So for that reason, universality, although it's going to, it is going to be one of the aspects of the concept, one of the aspects of self-determination, it's equally going to be the whole. And you might ask, well, why will that be the case? I mean, why will Hegel say that when we're dealing with universality, we're dealing with the universal concept. When we're dealing with particularity, we're dealing with the particular concept. How can this be seen to be connected to the idea that we're here speaking about something that's connected to self-determination? If we're talking about self-determination, what does every determination of self-determination have the status of being? It's a determination of the self, right? Not of something else. In that regard, you could say there's this absolute identity. It is that which is underway determining itself, it, 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 its own, its own being. This is what it has determined itself to be, if it's self-determined. So each of the specifications of what is self-determining are the self's specification. They are the self in this specification. So universality as a moment that can be distinguished from the other moments is something that can also be spoken of as the universal concept. And it's, it's not something that um, is in any respect limited by something standing outside itself. Rather, it doesn't show itself in some deficient other, like essence. It shows itself in itself, in what is exactly itself, what is not on a different subsidiary level, in order to have its character by not being something else. So here, Hegel says, the, the universal, in contrast to substance, is a free power, not a power of necessity. Now, what was true of the power exerted by substance over its accidents? That made it both something to be spoken of in terms of necessity and blind necessity. Remember, the accidents are contingent. 
There's nothing about them that the identity of substance has any intrinsic connection to, even if they're nothing other than the manifestation of the power of substance. Here, by contrast, we have what, could be, what he identifies as a, as a free power. Right? The universal is going to be differentiating itself. And these will be its own determinations. These will be what it is. These will be bound up with its own character, <coughs> because it is going to be that which determines itself. That is what it determines itself to be. So when it, it must determine itself. It must move to determination. And that determination can, in a sense, be distinguished from what it is as this absolute identity poised to be what it determines itself to be. Right? We can speak about it as something that has emerged from the logic of essence as being that which is, in a sense, to be what it determines itself to be. But it's that without having yet actually engaged in developing or differentiating itself. So to begin with, it's going to now move into that determining. And Hegel speaks of that determining as the particular concept. Or, he puts in the following way, the determinacy as of the concept is particularity. So you want to think about particularity as being the kind of determinacy that is specific to the concept. It's not quality. It's not the properties of the thing. It's not the accidents of substance. And we want to consider how it is different. Now, to begin with, Hegel speaks of, <coughs> of the determinacy of the concept as particularity. He doesn't speak about it as a particular. He doesn't speak about it in a way in which there is a specification of a plurality of particulars. Yet the moment you have particularity, namely the determinacy of the universal, of the concept, which we could consider perhaps as the determinacy that is a self-determined determinacy, it brings with it now another particularity that it is, in some respect, automatically contrasted with. What is that other particularity? So that Hegel will say the nature of the particularization of the concept of the universal is that the universal has a particularization that consists of, in a sense, two particularities. So in a certain sense, we could say at the very outset, it's sort of like a genus and species, where the genus is understood as that universal, which determines its own particulars, determines what they are. Well, here the universal determines its particularization such that it has, Hegel says, two particulars or particularizations. Later, when we come to individuality, he's going to speak of there being three. But to begin with, there are two. What are the two? One is particularization, or particularity, but the other is the universal in contrast to particularity. Because the universal in contrast to particularity is a particular determin is a determination of itself. In other words, in particularizing itself, it equally sets up a contrast between itself and its particularization. So it has two particularities. The universal and the particular are, shall we say, the moments of the concept or the, the differentiations that it gives itself. Now, Hegel distinguishes the particular from difference and uh, we came across the difference in terms of the identity in that was, in a sense, the first form of essentiality, where A is A, which involved a kind of difference. It was no difference. What's different about particularization from that kind of difference? The difference it was in identity, in essence, had what character? Yeah, negative character, right? It was something that was 
In being differentiated, it was just as much undercut and removed. Here, however, the particularity in question is on the same level as the universality. Because it is a determination of the self. And in this connection, Hegel says the following, which I think will also give you an idea of how universality does not stand in relation to particularity in the way in which a thing and its properties stand in relationship to one another. He says that the universal and the particular, in a sense, provide the complete, they exhaust the sphere of particularity to begin with. In other words, the sphere of particularity consists of the universal and the particular. <clears throat> because these are the differentiations of the universal. By the mere fact it gives itself a determination, you have that which is giving itself the determination and the determination. So we have these, these two aspects. But <clears throat> what is also true about them, these two determinations? Well, in some respect, they're united. Because the universal is determining itself. In determining itself, it, it particularizes itself, and its particularization consists of itself and the, and the particular. In a certain sense, the particular, Hegel will tell us, becomes thereby identical with the universal. How is that the case? How does the, the particular or particularity, in some respect, be that which unites the universal and the particular? So to begin with, in a sense, it's the universal, which is that which is pervading itself and its particularization. But in what sense does the particular, in a way, become that which could be said to pervade the universal and the particular? Because the universal is just made up of its particulars. Or the, well, and the universal becomes a particular becomes right. a particular in relation to the particular. So the particular could be said to be that which is you could say common to them is it like one with itself in both of them. So in this regard, the particular contains the universal in the particular, just as the universal contains the universal in the particular. And in containing one another. Hegel maintains that this constitutes individuality. Individuality is this unity. This unity that is posited through the determining of the universal. Where, in a sense, the differentiation of the universal is indi comprises individuality because it is completely at one with itself in this. Now you might ask yourself, well, why speak of this as individuality? What do we associate with individuality often? As it has, something that goes with it. Not just particularity, because you might think of particularity as something that could be shared by a plurality of particulars, just as in the examples I mentioned of the abstract universal. Uh, distinction? What kind of distinction? Uh, I want to say a particular distinction, but... I think you've got, you've got to go beyond that term <laughs> uh, to really capture what, what... An absolute distinction. A kind of absolute, or you speak of it as being unique, perhaps. I mean, what is it to be individuated? It's not to just be uh, something that is a member of a class. Because all the members as members are members in the same way. It's not just to have a certain property, because a plurality of factors can have the same property. To be an individual requires that something, in a sense, have a determinate identity, in some respect, in and through itself. An identity that does not come to it in virtue of something else. And if you think back upon how we've come upon different kinds of uh, entities, uh, you can see that none of them had individuality. Take something another, or something. 
Something was distinguished from other, but was it an individual? Could it be said to be unique? I mean, there's some who want to say that uh, individuation is, is, is to be thought of through negation. That is, we, we can get at what something is as an individual by taking into account what it is not. We can make use of something or another, in other words, as a way of individuating factors. But does the relation of something or other individuate either something or another? What happened to that relationship that indicated that it cannot suffice as an account of individuality or individuation. If something is just as much another. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they both end up occupying the same roles. If something is both a something and another, the other is both a something and another. So this is not really something that's going to, this, this relationship does not individuate them. It does not establish anything unique. What about the one? The one, in a sense, excluded all relationship to other. And you might say, well, it, it was unique in a sense, but what, what did the, the one have inside it? Nothing determinate. It just was, in a sense, the exclusion of all relation to other. It had the void. And the void really was no different than the one, and that led to a plurality of ones. Uh, there's no <coughs> way of really individuating one one from another one. <coughs> the one is just, in some respect, empty. It just signifies that it's not in a relation to anything else. But it doesn't have any individuating content beyond that. Right? Think about a thing and its properties. Does a thing have a, an individuality in having properties? Right? It's the substrate of them, but does the substrate have any determination of its own in virtue of the properties? The properties could just as well belong to something else. Yeah. Um, back to this is unity of the universal in particular yeah. becoming, uh, I guess it's, it would be two unities, like from the universal side there's a unity of both of them, and then from the particular side there's a unity of both of them, which creates individuality. Yeah, and in a sense they're both the same, yeah. they're both part of the same entity. And How does he account yeah. for a growing number of individuals, yeah. or plurality? Well, well interestingly that is sort of the outcome of individuality itself. I think that process it. just keep repeating? Well, it's, 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 it sort of comes out at the very end of the discussion in the following way. He, he says, that, look, individuality, properly speaking, and I just want to make one point about further about it, individuality. You can't get individuality in terms of the contrast of something and, and some another, of, of something and what it is not. That's not going to get you individuation. You're not going to get individuation in terms of the logic of essence because that which determines something that's determined can determine a plurality of different factors. The fact, mere fact that something is determined by something doesn't indicate that it's unique. Ground, for example, can ground a plurality of different things. A cause, as a determinate cause, can cause a multiplicity of things. So simply being in those relationships does not secure individuation. But here we have individuation, which individuality, which involves this unification of universal and particularity. But in a way, the universal and the particular as moments of the concept themselves are in unity with their counterparts. Each of the components of the concept are, in a way, the unity that individuality represents. And because of that, Hegel suggests that, in a way, with individuality, you have, in a sense, each of the moments of the concept become, are, are themselves individuals. Because they, they are intrinsically at one with the other aspect. And to some degree you have that in the very, the very labeling Hegel gives each of the sections. They're each the universal concept, the particular concept, individuality. Each of them could be said to be not just a particular, but a differentiated particular. They each could be said to be individuality. And so Hegel will have the laying out of the relationships of the concept being one in which each of the parts, each of these aspects, in a sense, take on the character of the others. 
The universal takes on the character of being a particular, a particularization, side by side with the particular, and now the individual. Now Hegel points out the concept here has, a th has three particularities in a way. The individuality could be said to be a particular determination of the concept. And then in a certain sense, particularity pervades all three. In a certain sense, they're all each individuals, because they're both universal and, in and particular. So individuality becomes like universality, because all, all of the factors are themselves individual. So the individual, in a sense, could be said to be that which pervades and what is self-identical in their differentiation. So all of the factors in this uh, relationship take on the character of their counterparts, take on the character of the whole. And Hegel presents this as leading to what he calls judgment, where you have what you can consider determination of the concept being in an external relationship to one another, where they're nonetheless united. Um, and that's what judgment, in a sense, does. It, it connects concept determinations in an immediate fashion and determines them in terms of that connection. Now, what I want us to do, I think, think about how these terms are laid out. And what we're going to be turning to is their exemplifications or their application in the reality of freedom, which is Hegel's concern in the philosophy of right. Uh, we'll turn to that next time. Um, bring along any questions you have regarding the preceding discussion of the concept. And one thing I want you to think about, you know, I, I've put before you the claim that Hegel is, is going to be presenting us the reality of freedom in such a way that self-determination always involves structures of rights or interactions between agents. And these will involve relations of, of reciprocity. I want you to think about whether the relations of reciprocity that underlie rights are similar or different from the reciprocity that occurs at the end of the logic of essence. The reciprocity into which causal relations revert. And I think it's, it's, it's important to see what the similarities and differences are.